for this uh, for this morning. Um, one is to see some interesting subyot in Parashat Lechucha with different mefarshim, and that's uh, that's of course a goal, um, of an important important goal. Talmud Torah. Um, the second goal is to gain some exposure to the world of Kitbeyad, of manuscripts, and how they can allow us sometimes to, to reconstruct lost Perushim, Perushim that didn't survive. Um, and the third goal, which is perhaps the most uh, important of the, um, of the three goals, is to um, give some exposure to different tools and resources that our Torah provides, which everyone, um, every one of us will then be able to use on our own, um, together with Chavrutot that we learn and other Shiurim, um, because that's what our Torah is made for, to, to help um, take our learning to new levels, to give us uh, resources and tools that we haven't had, we haven't had until now. So with that, uh, with that introduction, we're going to take a look at the first um, uh, first subya in Paragyud Bet in the beginning of our of this week's parasha. Now I will share my screen at certain points of this um, uh, um, of the uh, of the pre, of the of the shiur, um, but I won't be doing so at all times. Um, so what I would what I would ask everyone to do is on your own screens to call up alhatorah.org. If you put into the search A L H A T O R A H Al Hatorah one word dot org, um, so so that it should come up. If you're getting Google results, it should be one of the first results there, and that will take us to the home page of Al Hatorah. Um, I'll share for um, um, for the um, for the moment just um, for everyone to to follow with me. Um, Okay, so our Torah. So once uh, once our Torah comes up, so then there's all sorts of different resources on our Torah. We're going to be using the micro, primarily the Mikra Gedolo today, or maybe even exclusively. Um, but there's all sorts of other resources um, for learning Gemara, for learning Mishnah Torah, for learning um, Tur Shulchan Aruch, and other things as well. So we're going to click on the button for the Mikra Gedolo. In all, um, there's a, there's always an ability to get to all sorts of different resources by going to the sandwich menu button in the top corner there of the right bar, um, which will then give you resources on Tanakh, uh, Gemara, whichever um, whichever department um, one one is looking for. Um, so one can access resources that way. One can also hover over any of these and get to resources that way. We're just going to click simply on the button that says Mikro Kedolot, and that will open this week's parasha. And in the beginning of the parasha, and we're going to, using the um, side column, um, which uh, allows for easy navigation, we're, I'm going to click on the Yud Aleph, and that will take us to the first source, to the first topic that we're going to be looking at today. And um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Pasuk um, Yudaw. Okay. Um, so this Pasuk is in the middle of the story where Avram goes down to Avram and Sarai go down to Mitzrayim and actually starts the Pasuk before. Avram Mitzrayim ki now, one of the methods that one can use when one is learning um, any text, but um, certainly certainly Tanakh, to try to um, un to try to uncover different uh, different questions, different issues, is simply to translate um, and to compare one's translation to that of a learning partner of a chavruta, um, to compare it to existing translations. Um, and doing so will frequently highlight the difficulties in the verse or the ambiguities of the, um, of, of the particular pasuk that one is looking at. 
So in this pasuk, by Hikasheret Kriv Lavo Mitzrayma, by Yomer So we have we have a couple of words that aren't so simple to to interpret, um, and at first glance we might even gloss over them. Um, does anybody would anybody be willing to take a stab at translating at uh, giving a translation of the pasuk? Anybody? Any brave uh, brave participants? I got it. Thank, thank you. And when they approached uh, uh, coming to Egypt, and he said to Sarai, his wife, now I know that you are a beautiful woman. Great. So that's, um, thank you. Thank you for helping out here. Um, with, and so what we, what we want to focus on, so it, I, I think it was very, very good translation. Um, and you paused before before one of the words that you translated. Um, did anybody yeah. notice what um, where, yeah, where, yeah. where the pause was? Yeah, yeah. Now. Right. Now. Exactly. Exactly. So right before the words Hine Nayadati, you sort of gave it away with that uh, with yeah. the with the little pause there. Um, because those words are really the, um, the difficult words, or uh, at least a difficult word to translate. Um, that little word, na, the two letters, nun aleph there, um, what, what does na mean? So you, so, you, so you translated as now. And um, I think if we click on the E here, there's always, you can always click on the um, E for, for English translations, both of the verse and of the different parshanim. So many of the parshanim have E's like Rashi, Rashbam, Ramban. And the English here um, translates a little differently, right? The English here translates, behold, please. And those are the two, um, um, two basic possibilities that come up in the, in the different mefarshim as to what the word na means. So if we wanna know, well, what does the word na mean? Um, is which translation is a, better, is a better translation? Which translation is more accurate? So what do we do? How can we figure this out? So we have an important, yeah. They're going to be better than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily, but uh, um, but what we can learn from, and what's the, probably the most important thing is not necessarily which is the better translation in this case, but from comparing them, um, comparing the different translations, the whole idea of the method is that it sheds light on the difficulties and the issues in the psukim, and it can open up all sorts of sugyot. So, so that's why that's why the method is um, is very is very useful for us. So one thing we can do is when we could when we go to the word na, if we take our mouse and click on it, so then a concordance will open with instant results of where the of where the word appears in in Tanakh. So here we have a full listing, and on the side in the side panel. So one can see there's different forms depending on what the nikud of the form is. So in this case, there isn't that much difference between the two. And then sometimes there are related words. Like in this case, Anna is a related word. And in fact, Anna, we usually, um, in most cases, we would interpret it as, at least Anna with an Aleph, which sometimes appears with a hey as well. Um, but Anna with an Aleph, we would interpret as Please, as a begging. Um, so, um, so, so, so one option for understanding na would connect it to the word ana. But as we'll see, there are lots of psukim in which the meaning of please isn't so simple. And that's what motivates some of the mefarshim and like the translation we, we heard before, um, to translate the word na as a now rather than a please. So let's take a look, for example, at, uh, at a pasuk where um, it might not be so simple to interpret na as, as please. So um, we could even start with, let's say, uh, number, number six on the list. So this is also from this week's parasha. Hashem is talking to Abraham, and he, and he says, So I guess one could say 
that the nadir means please. Please, Hashem is saying to Avram, please look up at the sky. But is there, was there such a need? Every time Hashem talks to Avram, he doesn't use the word nah. So this was, uh, he had to beg him to look up to, to look up to the sky. Or what about the next pasuk? But Tomer Sarai al Avram, he may na at Sarani Hashem miledet. Well, that's going to be very difficult to understand that as a please. And we'll see later that there is a way of understanding even that na as a please. But that would be an example of a pasuk that na wouldn't work so well as ana and would motivate Mefarshim to look for, to, to provide a different interpretation. And we'll see later that Ibn Ezra is going to quote a couple of psukim that are even more difficult than, than that one. So that's, that's what we can do, though, with a concordance. And a concordance is basically the most important tool um, for learning, uh, for studying Tanakh. And what um, the, the difficulty with a concordance is sometimes knowing what the root is to, to look up in the concordance. You also have to have a concordance, and they're expensive. Um, and you have to take it off the shelf and thumb through the pages, and over, uh, over a 1,000 pages, usually, unless you have a really teeny one. Um, so so um, what, what using technology allows us to do is something that would take time to do. We can now close the, if we close the concordance, any word that we want, we can look up in the concordance by, with, a, with a single click and the results will come up, except that right now my computer is, is providing me with the same, same word that we, that we saw before. Okay, well, um, I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, so in this concordance though, we have a few other tools, which, which we should take a look at as, as well. Um, another tab is a dictionary here. And we'll see that the dictionary um, will give an interpretation of the word na, which actually combines um, the different, different possibilities. We have entreaty or exhortation, and we also have now. And so that's a, that's a second tool here. Then we have a graphical concordance, which will show us where the word appears in all sorts of different sfarim in Tanakh. And you can click on any of these bars in Bereshit, let's say, to get all the results from, say, for Bereshit. And sometimes we'll have words that appear mostly in a certain, mostly in Torah, let's say, and not in other books in Tanakh, or sometimes mostly in books of Ketuvim. And sometimes that is relevant because there's sometimes there's, there are words that change their meaning between different periods of Tanakh. So the graphical concordance allows us to, to see that. Now, at first glance, it would look like the word na is much more common in Torah and Nevi'im than it is in all the other um, in books of, uh, in all the books of Ketuvim. However, sometimes this can be deceiving um, because we have to take into account the um, size of the work. Um, so if we have a larger book, so of course the word is going to appear a, a greater number. Um, of course, we would expect that the word, uh, word might appear a greater number of times. So the, the checkboxes on the bottom allow us to change um, the, um, to, uh, to, um, to, to adjust for the, size of, for the size of the work. So by using this recuse button, the concentration of the, of the word, we can now compare based on the size and we'll see that the, that the books in Ketuvim have about the same um, uh, frequency of the usage of the word nah as books in Torah and Nevi'im. So there really is no significant difference between, between the books. The third tool that we have here is Milonim Kidumim. So that fourth, that fourth tab that we saw before was a modern dictionary. Milonim Kidumim is different dictionaries from the period of the Rishonim. So we have, for example, Machberet Menachem, which was really the first complete dictionary. Before him, Rav Sadja had made a partial uh, um, type of dictionary work, but Menachem was the first complete dictionary. And his rival, Dunash, Menachem ben Saruk and Dunash ben Labrat, um, wrote criticisms of, of, of Menachem's Machberet. And then their students, Tamidei Menachem and Yehudi ben Sheshet, who was a student of Dunash, then wrote responses to Menachem, to Dunash, to the Talmidim. And there was a very lively back and, back and forth, 
over all sorts of fundamental principles of the Hebrew language, as well as individual words and individual individual psukim. And then we have some later ones like Rabbi Yonah Ibn Janach, Radak, Radak's father, Rabbi Yosef Kimchi. And so we can use these dictionaries to give us easy access to what different Rishonim, how they defined um, different, um, uh, different words or almost every word in, in Tanakh. Now these, these works are, would be relatively inaccessible because you'd have to sit there um, again, just like in, a, in even harder than a concordance trying to find where they discuss the word. And sometimes their roots are different than ours. But with this one click, easy access to everything. So now one can, one can do all sorts of research that one didn't have the ability um, to do without enormous amount of work until now. Okay, so leaving the, leaving the concordance, and so we're going back to, to our, our Pasuk. And we're going to take a look at Rashi. Midrash Agada, Sha'ad Akshav Lohi Kirba Mirov Sinu Shabishnehem. The Akshav Al Yede Maase. So Rashi here is citing a Midrash Agada, which we don't know exactly which Midrash this is. We're going to take a look at a couple of Midrashim in a second. Um, but this midrash is apparently a midrash that Rashi had that is not um, is, is is not extant um, uh, today. Um, but um, what we can see from this midrash is that how is Rashi understanding the word hinena, which which interpretation is Rashi taking? Which translation? No. No. Exactly. So Rashi is Rashi, and in order to do that, Rashi says that until now, Avram didn't know that Sarai was Nisha Yifat Mareh, Yifat Mareh, and it's only now that he Ve'achshav Al Yedei Maaseh. Now, what this Maaseh was that allowed Avram to see now that only now that Sarai was a beautiful woman. Um, is not um, is not clear. There are a couple different uh, midrashim that provide that fill out some of that information. We'll see soon. Um, but what's what's interesting for us is that Rashi takes the hinena yadati as now, and in order to do so, he has to understand that Avram didn't know until now that Sarai was beautiful, and this of course raises even certain halachic issues that uh, some of the super commentaries on Rashi raise that a person shouldn't marry a woman without looking at her. Maybe she would, maybe he'll find her to be ugly and that will cause problems later. Um, so, so it's kind of odd, we would think that Avram didn't know that Sarai, that Sarai was beautiful, but nevertheless, that's the, um, that's the approach that Rashi takes. Then he brings a davar acher, she'al yedei torach haderech adam mitbaze, v'zo amidza biyofya. So then he gives a second, Rashi gives a second interpretation, which attempts to grapple with that issue in a different way. In the first line of Rashi, he had said that, how did, how was it possible that Avram didn't know that Sarai was beautiful? Because there was sniyot shebi shnehem. They didn't look at each other too, uh, uh, too closely. Um, the second interpretation says, no, Avram always knew that Sarai was beautiful, but he thought that she would become less beautiful because they were traveling and they were all filthy and dirty and traveling through the desert um, wasn't like uh, traveling on an airplane. Um, so um, they were grimy and they didn't have uh, bathing facilities. So you would have expected that Sarai would, um, would, not, uh, would not be so beautiful after this whole long trek. But, but vizo amida biofya. So that's Rashi trying to grapple with that, with the obvious difficulty that the um, Pasuk raises. Upshuto, then Rashi tells us, and here's the simple interpretation. Now, simple shot is always relative because what's shot for one person is not necessarily shot for somebody else, might be drash for somebody else. Um, but this is what Rashi thinks the, the pshat is. Hinena, higia sha'a sheyesh lid og al yofyeich. Yadati ze yamim ki yefat mareat, ve achshav anu ba'in bein anashim shchorim u mechoarim achihem shel kushiyim. That was Lashon Chol in, in, in that pasuk, um, the way, at least the way I'm reading. Um, so Rashi, 
um, in his third inter third interpretation, says that he thinks the pshat is that he neina isn't telling us that um, it's only now that Avram realized that Sarai was beautiful. He says, Yadzati zeyamim, I've known for a long time that you're beautiful. But what is the hineina? What is the now? Now we have to be concerned about the fact that you are an Isha Yifat Mareah, because now it has implications. Until now, it, wasn't, it didn't matter to us. But now because, and here we see uh, somewhat, uh, I guess what from a modern perspective, we would consider this a racist comment. Um, for, uh, for, for Rashi in medieval times, that was a pretty, um, um, I think it was a fairly common um, um, view. Um, so, um, Rashi, so Rashi says that we're coming to, into a country where people are um, not, uh, they're basically um, white was beautiful from his, from his perspective. So here we're coming to a country where everyone is of darker complexion. And then Rashi has a final line where he compares it to this pasuk in Breshit Yotet in next week's parashat, parashat Vayera. And we'll have to try to come back to that later to understand what exactly Rashi is doing in the comparison. So first of all, um, I'm going to unshare my screen for a second, um, just so we can all, um, also, um, also, uh, also, at least I can see everyone. Um, so the first question that that we want to that we want to look at is, what do we do? We have a Rashi here that gives us all sorts of midrashim. He, one of them he quotes explicitly as a midrash, midrash agada. then he gives a davar acher, and then he gives a pshuto. So what is, what is one of the first things we want to do when, we're, when we study a Rashi? So one of the, one of the most obvious things that we, that we would like to do is we'd like to compare Rashi with his sources. So Rashi is, I would, I would estimate, and I think different people have different, uh, might have slightly different estimates, but there's a vast amount of Rashi. I would estimate even up to about 90% of Rashi is borrowed or adapted, anthologized. Uh, you could use different words, and some of them reflect a slightly different, uh, there's some nuances there. Um, anthologized from earlier sources, mostly Midrashim in Breshit, there's a huge amount of Breshit Rabbah and also Tanhuma that um, it gets used by Rashi. Also Targumim, like Unculus particularly, and as well as sometimes dictionaries, sometimes like the lexicons that we saw before, like Machberet Menachet. Um, but Rashi's primary raw materials that he's using to create his Perush are the Midrashim. Now, how do we access those, those Midrashim? So on top of every Rashi, there's a little reish, which you should see on your own, own screens. And if you click that reish, that will open up a Rashi, uh, Rashi Amifoar, which means Rashi with both his sources and super commentaries. And it's a growing collection. It will hopefully, hopefully continue to, to expand. So let's click on the reish on that pasuk. And I'll share my screen again, in case anyone doesn't have their own. Okay, so now what we'll see here is Rashi with Midrash Rabbah, Midrash Tanhuma, some of Mefarshe Rashi. Now this isn't a full list. There's more available. And as with any, um, any one of the tools on, um, on our Torah, any one of the Mikro Kedolot, there's a very important button and that's the gear button. The gear button is up here near the center of the red bar, right next to the title. And that gear bar allows us to select which sources we would like to have open, which mefarshim we would like to have open. So that way we can customize our mikra otkidolot, or in this case, our rashi and mefowar. Um, for most people, having all of these mefarshim open, and if we went to the other mikra otkidolot, we would see um, probably almost uh, 100 different uh, mefarshim, which would be available. So having them all open on the page would be kind of overwhelming. Um, so one gets to select which ones one wants to display on a regular basis. If on a particular pasuk, we want, uh, we want a certain combination generally, but on a particular pasuk, we would like to see other sources. So then there's a button on the bottom, 
which will tell us what is available on this verse. Um, different psukim have different, uh, obviously have different availabilities of different miparshim. And then we could click on any one of those um, buttons. Let's say I just clicked on Midrash Agada, and it adds the Midrash Agada on this, pas on this pasuk, which might be relevant for knowing what Rashi's sources are. Okay, so here we have Rashi, and underneath Rashi up on top in the, in the center, and Midrash Raba, Midrash Tanchuma. So we can see what Rashi is doing, where he's collecting from, um, and um, what, and sometimes we can compare by comparing Rashi to a source. So we can notice um, interesting details, interesting modifications of the sources that, that Rashi makes. So in, in this case, so Rashi is drawing off of Midrash Rapa. So we can see that which part of Rashi is coming from Midrash Rabbah, from Rashid Rabbah? The middle part. The Davar and Rashi. That, that part comes from Rashid Rabba in almost, almost exactly, almost identical um, language. Then the next part of Rashi Rabba is also used by Rashi. So when Rashi gives an upshuto, not every pshat in Rashi is something that he's creating himself or is something that isn't found in Midrash. Sometimes the pshuto in Rashi will also be an adapt adaptation of something that's in, of at least a kernel that's in the Midrash. So if we look at the next part of Midrash Rabba, we'll see that Rabbi Zeira b'shem Rabbi Simon, Amar, halachnu ba'aram naharayim uba'aram nahor, v'lo matzanu isha na'a kimoteich, achshav sha'anu nichnasim limkom ke'urim u'shorim, and then the continuation, we'd have to move to the next pasuk in Midrash Rabbah, is, um, so the concern in Midrash Rabbah there is, there is basically a Kalvah Homer. Even in Aram Naharayim and Aram Nahor, there was no one as beautiful as Sarai. So now that we're coming to a place like Mitzrayim, where the people are less beautiful, um, so then there's even, even greater, even greater concern. And Midrash Rabbah then continues, therefore, Imri Na'achotia. So that, so the elements in Rashi, so the, the racist, in quotes, elements in Rashi of Anubayim, Bein Anashim, Shorim, and Mechorim, that wasn't Rashi himself who invented them. Almost the exact same language, Mekom, Ki'urim, Ushorim. So Rashi perhaps reversed the, reversed the order of the words. And sometimes these are just differences between different manuscripts of Rashi Rabbah, and Rashi might have had a, Breshi, a version of Breshi Rabbah, which reversed the words. And sometimes Rashi is, is citing by memory from Breshi Rabbah. So differences like that of Shorim or Mechorim don't necessarily reflect anything that significant. Um, but this idea of that now I have to worry, not that now I know that you're beautiful, um, is exactly the way Rabbi Ze'era is, is understanding the Pasuk. Except what Rashi is adding that isn't in Breshit Rabbah, or what, uh, what does Rashi make explicit that wasn't so clear um, from, from Breshit Rabbah itself? So Rashi is emphasizing that structurally something important is going on here, um, that the Hinena is, um, is explained not by the words that immediately follow it, follow that phrase, Hinena. Not, so meaning the hinena yadati, the hinena is not going on yadati ki ishayefat mareat, but rather on the next verse uh, or the next verses. The hayaki ruota hamitrim. So I'm actually gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to my other tab for a second because um, we need the um, we need the regular uh, regular micro kizos. I'm I'm exiting the Rashi part. So pasuk yudet. Now we have a concern. So he nena in parentheses, Yadati ki that I've always known, or as Rashi says, Yadati ze yamim ki So the he nena 
goes on, what comes after that parenthetical remark goes to Pasuk Yudet. He may now, the concern is now, what is the concern now that the Mitzrim will see you? So the Midrash didn't address all of that. Um, the Midrash doesn't address the, um, the, how the syntax of the Pasuk uh, works. That Rashi does and makes it makes more explicit. But the Pshuto in Rashi, we can now see from comparing him to the Midrash, is found already in, in Breshit. Uh, the basic interpretation is found in Breshit Rav. Now, we're going to take a look now at Rashi's grandson, Rashban. Now, if you open any, any other um, uh, Mikraot Gedolot and this, these Psukim, one won't find much of a Rashbam on, on these Psukim. Why not? Because Rashbam's Pirush survived to modern times, into modern times, in only one manuscript. As with many of many medieval works, um, there's some medieval works that survived in hundreds of manuscripts, but that's very rare. Rashi is, is one of the only examples of such a thing. Um, even Tamu Bavli and many Masechto survived in only one manuscript, in some, in, in some cases up to about, um, you know, uh, um, you know, maybe three or five, but a very small number. Rashi and most Masechto in Talmud, uh, of, of the Talmud Bavli also survived in only a handful of manuscripts. I think the most we have of any, most manuscripts of Rashi and any Masech that we have, I think is about seven. Um, so sometimes it's zero and it could range from about zero to seven. Um, frequently it's one or two or three per Masech. Rashi and Torah survived in over 250 uh, manuscripts, not all of which are complete, um, but we have this incredible um, wealth of manuscripts in which Rashi survived. But most other works were not so fortunate. And in the case of Rashbam, he survived in only one manuscript. And that manuscript wasn't known even until the beginning of the 18th century, when it was published for the first time. So even though books were, had been printed already for about 250 years, and Rashi's uh, Perush had been printed already um, almost 250 years before, uh, Rashbam was first printed. In 1705, that's when Rashbam's Perush was printed from a manuscript that survived in some pile by, and by chance, Rav David Oppenheim um, was alerted to its existence by uh, some sort of collector. And he writes how the beginning part of the manuscript had been eaten away by mice. So we don't know for sure if he knew exactly that that's what had happened or he was just guessing that that's what had happened. But what we do know is that this manuscript, which originally had come from worms, I'm from Vermeiza. Um, and this manuscript was missing the first three parashot, first three parashiot of the Torah. So it was missing Breshit, Noach, and Lechlecha. So the lone manuscript in which Rashbam's commentary survived didn't even survive in its entirety. It was missing at the beginning of the manuscript and at the end of the manuscript. So we have this, uh, we have this wonderful possibility of seeing Rashbam and these par parashot, but it was missing. So fortunately, one of the first prakim, the, um, of those first 17 prakim, the first three parashiyot, uh, which are 17 chapters. So the first parak, parak Aleph, survived in almost its entirety in a different manuscript. Um, this manuscript is also a famous manuscript, Munich 5. And so one parak we can basically fill in from that manuscript, but the other 16 chapters of Rashbam's commentary didn't, weren't uh, able to, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't have them. We still don't have them completely, but at least now we have a reconstruction of a good, um, of a significant portion, portion of them. And we're going to talk a little um, about uh, some of the methods and how, and, and how, they'll, and how they are useful, useful to us. And um, so, so as we said, though, so Rashbam's um, commentary was missing at the beginning and, um, and at the end. And even this lone manuscript that survived in the Shoah, it went AWOL. Um, we don't know whether the Nazis um, destroyed it, looted it, or whether somebody took it and it, um, and it, still, it still, might be, still might exist someplace. And my dream is that someday we're, we're going to discover that, uh, that manuscript. So if anybody has any leads on that, 
Um, so uh, so uh, be, be in touch, probably by private, uh, pr private message. Um, so, so, Rash so how do we reconstruct Rashbam's, the missing portions of Rashbam's commentary? So we're fortunate that we have lots of different manuscripts of Baalei Atosafot. And I'm going to stop sharing this, this uh, screen for a second. I'm going to share a different, a different screen now, which is going to be a copy, a, a digitization, a digitized copy, um, a PDF of one of these manuscripts of a Tosafist work called the Paneach Raza. Paneach Raza was written by Rabbi Yitzhak to Rabbi Yehuda, probably uh, 13th, late 13th century. And he cites um, many different earlier Tosafist, Tosafist works. And there are printed versions of the Paneach Raza, but unfortunately, in the um, early, way before Rashvam was printed, the Paneh Raza got printed um, by the Maharal's, Maharal Mifrag's son-in-law. And the Maharal Mifrag's son-in-law took some liberties with, uh, with the text. And basically he decided he was going to edit. And he changed and added and subtracted um, whatever he wanted. And for some odd reason, all printings until today, there is, there is still is no, no printing of the Paneh Raza, which goes back to the original manuscript. All subsequent printings, even a printing that sort of pretends to be um, a more uh, critical version of the Paneh Raza is all based on this Maharal son-in-law's uh, version of the Paneh Raza, which in some cases has, is totally different um, than, the, than the manuscript. To complicate things, there are two different families of manuscripts of the Paneh Raza. And we're gonna take a look now at the mi minority family, which was basically unknown um, that, there were, um, that there were significant differences until recently. So I'm gonna share my screen now, and we're gonna see a page from this, uh, from this manuscript. And what we'll see is that I've highlighted with some red lines, where there are some citations in the manuscript. In this case, if anyone can, I'm gonna I'll blow it up a little more, so maybe it'll be a little easier to see. Can anyone make out the words there? So that's a vav, even though it looks like a, a nun sofi. The rashbam. The rashbam. The rashbam, and the next letter is a pay. Peyud, Peyresh. So it takes a little, it takes a, uh, a little adjustment, um, takes a little time sometimes to adjust to reading manuscripts. But after a while, um, some, of the, some of the things that are very, very difficult, it looks like uh, hieroglyphics at first. Um, so it becomes much easier to read. So Virashbam Peyresh, Vakna'ani Az Ba'aretz, Moshe Katava Torah, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is also a interpretation of Rashbam that was unknown until recently. Um, but we're not going to focus on this one now. We're going to focus on the second one, which has to do with our pasuk. So, so this one starts, Hine na yadati. Can everyone make out those, uh, those words? A little hard to. Um, but peresh, pay, pay in the beginning, and then rashbam. Peresh, rashbam. And then this word, I'm a little in doubt as to what the word says. It's either a ze or a zo. Um, is what it looks like, but I'm not positive. Na, our word in the pasuk, na, kemo she'ar na, like other na's in Tanakh. Anyone want to give us give a try at the next next letter here? So that's a lamid with a little chupchuk, a little geirish on top. Lishon. Next word. As a kuf in the middle. So bakasha. So what's Rashbam telling us? That this na is just like every other na. Lashon bakasha. So like the English translation on the site, please rather than a now. Now we could continue uh, breaking our eyes and teeth over uh, Rashbam in manuscript, but uh, we're, we're going to move. We're going to move back to the Mikrot Gadolot uh, itself. I think everyone will, uh, 
um, have an easier time reading it from the from the Mikrot Gedolot. So if we scroll down a little on the on our page, we'll get to Rashbam Hamishuzar. I'll share in case anybody wants to read on with me. Um, Hinenayadati Zena Kemosha'arna Lishon Bakasha. Behachi Perusho Bebakasha Mimha. Lefi Sheyadati Gishayiru Otaha Mitzrim the Amiru Ishtozo. Lefi Sheat Yafa the Haregu Oti. Lefi Hach Imrina the Gomer. So Rashbam is reacting, obviously, to when he says that this Naz is a Lashon Bakasha. So he's reacting to, um, as Rashbam frequently does, to his grandfather. Um, Rashbam and Rashi even engaged in personal discussions. And Rashbam's almost entire Perush is parallel to, let's say, what Balea Tosafot in Gemara, their relationship to Rashi. The same thing is true about Rashbam ala Torah's relationship to Rashi ala Torah. So Rashbam is a reaction. Sometimes he absorbs certain elements of Rashi, and very, very frequently he's coming um, in opposition to Rashi's perush. So as opposed to Rashi, who says that this na is an achshav, is a now, Rashbam is saying, no, this na is just like every other na in Tanakh, it's a please. But now we have a problem. Because what does it mean? Please, I know that you're a beautiful woman. So the next part of Rashbam then says that the na doesn't, similar to Rashi's final um, shot uh, approach, um, but slightly different. Rashbam says this na isn't going on the words that follow, but rather it's connected to imri na. So Rashbam notes that we have the word na comes up in Pasuk Yud Aleph and again in Pasuk Yud Gimel. Now, what one can always do is there's an icon for clicking on the full chapter. So if we want to see the full chapter, if we want to see multiple Pasukim at once, even if you're in the Mikro Gedolot mode, so then you can um, click on that full chapter button, which is above either the Pasuk or the pe Perush, if you want to see either the Pasukim in full chapter or the Perush of the individual commentator in full chapter mode. So here we can see in Pasuk Yud Aleph, by Hika Sheri Kriva Vomitzraim of Ayomer Sarayishto Hinei Na Yadati. And then we have in Yud Gimel, Imri Na Achotiyat. Rashbam says that we have a Na, and then basically we have an ellipsis until the next Na. So what is the Hinei Na? The Hinei Na is an introduction which gets completed only with the second Imri Na. Where is the please? The please is what, is what is Avram asking Sarai. The please isn't that please you are a beautiful lady. Um, the please is to say achotiat so that I will be able to survive. And all of everything that came in between the two Na words is basically a parenthetical statement or parenthetical introduction, which explains the need for Avram's Avram's request from, from Sarah. So reconstructed Rashbam based on, and basically this is from the, that manuscript that we just saw with slight modifications, which um, there's a, based on some other sources, which we'll, um, which we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll discuss in a second. Um, so Rashbam is, um, is saying that the na here means please like in the rest of Tanakh. And then Rashbam says, if we click on the link there so we can see the psukim. Avram in the next parak says to Lot, please, and then you could explain the please as please let's not have a fight. But Rashbam says, no, it means please. Now, parenthetically, let's not have a fight. So what, so please what, what am I asking you to do? Obviously we shouldn't have a fight. That I don't have to ask please for. But the please says, So once again, we have two um, use, uses of the word na, 
in consecutive um, sukim. And the first na is only is understood only when we get to the second na. Similarly, Rashbam says in the pasuk that Rashi quoted earlier, and this may help us understand what Rashi meant. Al na achai tareyu both says to the people of Sodom, he ne na li shetevanot. So the, the na here is the first na is explained only when we get to the second na. The request is 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 elucidated only in the second second pasuk. And the hachi perusho, Rashbam says, he ne na yadati me'az. Rashbam clarifies that I always knew. It's not now I know. I always knew ki shayifat mareat. But the na goes on what's about to what's about to follow. Now, we said that this Rashbam comes from that manuscript that we saw, this London manuscript of Panach Raza. Now, how do we know that that manuscript, when it cites Rashbam, that this is a faithful citation of Rashbam? How do we know that Rashbam really said this? And maybe the manuscript made a mistake. Maybe that wasn't Rashbam. Maybe it was somebody else. Um, so, of course, one has to do some serious work to analyze each one of these works that might, each one of these Tosafist works that cites Rashbam. One has to examine the language that Rashbam uses. And sometimes there are fingerprints, just like we all speak and with certain cadences, with certain uh, languages, with certain fillers even that we use all the time. Rishonim mm -hmm. also wrote with certain identification markers and one would be astonished, but there are certain linguistic um, usage, usages, certain phrases that appear in Rashbam that appear in almost no other parshan. So that's how one can be ascertain that these citations are, are really authentic and really came from uh, Rashbam. In some cases though, and this case is one of them, we're fortunate that Rashbam himself alludes to, the, um, to, to, this, to an interpretation in a different place. So if we go to, the, we're gonna use the book button up on top here. And we're going to select Breshit Perek Havzayin. And we're going to see now in the story where Yitzhak wants to give the brachot to Yaakov and Esav. So, And then in the next pasuk, he says, So so here, obviously, a please reading is going to be a little difficult. And this would be another case where some Mepharshim would say, and like, let's say, looking at Ibn Ezra here, he named na kimo ata. Now, I obviously I haven't been old forever. Now I feel I'm old and maybe about to die, Yitzhak is telling Yisav. Now I am zakein, lo yadati yomoti. And therefore, go take your, I would like you to, um, take your um, uh, your bow and and uh, get me uh, get me something to eat, so I will give you a bracha. Rashbam though on this pasuk says he na ani mivakesh mimacha. So how we can see already that how is Rashbam understanding this pasuk? That I am asking, um, I'm I'm almost begging you bishvil shezakanti. And what is the, what am I asking you to do? The next Rashbam and the next pasuk then explains sana chilecha kofel na sheni bekan. And then what does he say? Kemo shepeirashti eitzel. Our pasuk ki neina yadati ki isha yefat mareat. Now Rashbam doesn't tell us what he explained there. He just tells us that I gave an explanation of this doubled na in that pasuk that we've been looking at the, um, the, uh, this morning of Reshit Yud Bet Yud Aleph. What we can gather though from this Rashbam is that here too, he's explaining that na is a Lashon Bakasha, is a please. And the Bakasha isn't explained in the first pasuk which says na, but the explanation of what the request is is, comes in the in the following pasuk where we have the second usage of the na. And so we can extrapolate from this Rashbam 
and that the what he explains in Breshit Yudbet would be similarly um, that the first na is that the na means please, but it's not explained in the first verse, rather in the later verse. And if we now go back, closing up this one, go, go back to our Pasuk and compare what Rashbam says there with how he, how he understands our Pasuk, it would certainly support that the citation of Rashbam is from Rashbam himself. This would be exactly what we would, what we would expect. So that's one method. These are different methods that we can use, ling certain linguistic formulations, certain uh, Rashbam himself, self-references, um, and the method that Rashbam uses. So in this case, Rashbam here in the citation says, V'chein derech hamikra. Now, one of, the one of the things we can do in our mikra kedolot is when we highlight a word we, or, or a phrase, we can then do a search. And we can see how the term derech hamikra is used and by which racial name or which sources it's used. So we're going to set if the default gives a distance of five between the words, but we're going to change that five as soon as the um, as soon as that loads um, to to a zero. So we're going to want derech hamikra when the words are adjacent to each other, when the words come consecutively, and when there's no distance and and in that order. No, so no distance between them and in that order. And we're going to do the chapes again, and we'll see there'll be less results um, than the than the first time. And then we'll be able to see about half as many results. And then we can open up in the side panel and see which mifarshim use this use this um, this phrase. And we'll see that Rashbam uses the phrase derech hamikra on ten different occasions, or nine different occasions. And one of them is this mishuvzar. Rashbam all over talks about derech hamikraot, um, um, in. Uh, which means the way of the way of Tanakh, the way of the Torah, um, the way the way the Torah writes, and he gives different types of things that the Torah that the Torah does. So we can see that this is a language that Rashbam uses, but it's not exclusive to Rashbam. Rashi uses it only slightly less, a slightly lesser number of times, though it's significant because Rashi, the corpus that we have of Rashi's Perushim is much much larger than what we have from Rashbam. But this wouldn't be an exclusive Rashbam, but it certainly fits. And this is one of the hallmarks of Rashbam, that when he tries to interpret the Torah, um, so he tries to show us, he tries to give us parallels from other places in the in Tanakh where um, we have a, we have similar types of things that are going on. And this is what is called intra-scriptural exegesis, um, using the scripture itself, using Tanakh itself to explain itself. And that's one of the one of the characteristics that distinguishes between Pshat and Drash. What Pshat does is it tries to use the text itself to interpret itself, as opposed to Midrashic approach, which will add things into the text which aren't necessarily um, supported by use in other um, other places. So, so that's a formulation here in this in this um, interpretation of, of Rashbam that we would say ah that's that's um, not a, not perhaps not a distinct fingerprint of Rashbam, but certainly something that is matim to uh, Rashbam. And um, the, um, the other um, other other issue, uh, the other other factor that uh, that we can that we can see here is that we have a relationship sometimes between Rashbam's commentaries and Ibn Ezra's commentaries. Now, if we see in this Mikra Ot-Gazolot, we'll see that there are two Perushim of Ibn Ezra, actually even three Perushim. The second one is really divided into two. So we'll see that we have Ibn Ezra Aleph. That was Ibn Ezra's earlier commentary, which he wrote in Italy. Ibn Ezra was, was basically a nomad um, after he was, uh, had, to, had to flee um, Andalusia in Spain um, because of the Almohad pers persecution. So Ibn Ezra then um, wandered from country to, uh, to country, um, first Italy, then France, later England, and his first set of commentaries on Tanakh were written in Italy. Those were written before, probably before Rashbam wrote his commentary, or at least before Ibn Ezra had access to Rashbam's commentary. 
when Ibn Ezra then came to France and wrote a second set of commentaries on many books of Tanakh, um, he probably already had, or the evidence seems to indicate that he had access to Rashbam's Perush, at least orally and perhaps even a written copy. Now let's take a look at Ibn Ezra on this, on, on this pasuk. Umilat na, Ibn Ezra says, kimo ata. So Ibn Ezra explains like, um, just remind me of, uh, of your name, the, um, the person who, who translated the now at the beginning of the, the beginning of today. Who, who was that? Okay, whoever. The, the, so, so. Um, so okay, so the, like that. So that translation is the way Ibn Ezra translates translates our pasuk. So na is like now, and then Ibn Ezra gives a couple of examples which would be proofs for why na wouldn't work so well with please. One of them is that pasuk in Breshit Kavzayin that we saw with the brachot of Yitzhak and where Yitzhak is speaking to Asa, where he named na zakanti. At first glance, at least, it would be hard to say that that na means please. The second is an even better proof, probably, for Ibn Ezra. Oi na lanu ki chatanu, the pasuk from Eicha. Um, so that pasuk is going to be very difficult. Nafla teret roshenu, oi na lanu ki chatanu. So Ibn Ezra says, well, how could that mean please? Now, one could say that even in that pasuk, the na could mean please. And one could say that nafla teret roshenu, oi na lanu, please help us. Um, or there's some understood request that isn't explicit in the Pasuk. But in order to do that, one has to add something to the Pasuk. It's certainly not simple, and Ibn Ezra doesn't think it's even possible. And one could basically go through almost all of the usages before of na in um, uh, uh, the, almost all the usages of the word na and go back and forth in many of them between the two possibilities of please or, or now. Um, and you could have come up with different readings of the, of, of the verses. So that's Ibn Ezra in his first commentary. In his second commentary, we have Ibn Ezra is, con continues to maintain that position, but now he adds something. And here there's a little bit of a reconstruction because there was, there's apparently something missing in the, in, the loan, in, in the manuscript that we have here. Ha'omer shemilat na lishon bakasha or or Ibn Ezra here is obviously reacting to somebody, to somebody who explains that na here means please. And Ibn Ezra says, well, what is that person? How is that person going to understand? And then he gives us three psukim. You mat na et So please let him, let him die. So it sounds a little, a little strange. It's maybe, maybe not impossible. For Ibn Ezra, though, it doesn't seem very likely. And oina lanu ki chatanu, the pasuk that he cited in his first commentary. So Ibn Ezra is reacting to somebody. Who is he reacting to? The likelihood is that in between his first commentary and second commentary, when he came to France and now is now writing his second commentary, he now has Rashbam. And Ibn Ezra and Rashbam were somewhat rivals for who was going to produce the, the best uh, Pshat commentary. And Ibn Ezra is most likely reacting here to what uh, we have as reconstructed Rashbam, but was part of Rashbam's original, original commentary. It's Rashbam who says that Nahir means Lashon Bakasha. And Ibn Ezra says, well, that doesn't work in many other, in, in many other psukim. Now, if we take a look at Ramban here, so we'll see that there's something very interesting in, in Ramban. Ramban um, has, um, has, has a couple of different discussions in, um, on this verse. First, he talks about, he addresses Rashi's, in quotes, racist um, um, approach. And he says, this doesn't match uh, his, uh, the, the reality as he knows it. Um, so he thinks that um, this, uh, there, there was no difference between, um, a, a, between the different, uh, different countries. And that's, a first, that's the first part of the discussion. 
In the second part of the discussion, he goes he goes back to say the katav rabbeinu to address what Rashi wrote the katav rabbeinu Shlomo he ne nayadati midrash agata adachshav lo hikirba. And if we notice in this edition of Ramban, there are brackets around this this the next two paragraphs, right? The bracket starts before the katav rabbeinu Shlomo. That's where it opens, and then the bracket closes at the words of the kulam kacha at the end of the next paragraph. Now. You'll see a footnote at the end of the bracket, and that footnote Yud Aleph tells us, I knew, and you can follow this link to read more about Ramban's additions to his Perush. We, we know today, based on different manuscripts, that almost every um, commentator um, that, uh, that ever wrote um, would update their, their commentary over the years. And it's a very logical thing. We all know that what we say today, tomorrow we come up with something else. Um, tomorrow we have something to add. Tomorrow we change. Tomorrow we realize that what we said um, needs to be uh, corrected, adjusted, deleted. Um, the same is true even of Gizalei Torah. Um, frequent, now, it's not so often that they decide that what they said was wrong, but frequently they add as new sources came to them not everyone had a full library like we have, uh, like we have today, at their disposal. Sometimes they didn't have access to different works, and it was only at a later point that they got access. Um, sometimes they just didn't think of something. Sometimes they read a different commentary, and that commentary um, caused them to revisit what they had previously written. So Ramban is not an is not the exception, but he's rather the the rule as far as this. And in Ramban's case. So except what's unique about Ramban is that Ramban sent lists of his corrections or his additions that he made to his Perush when he, when he left, after he left Spain and made it to Eretz Yisrael. From Eretz Yisrael, he sent back to Spain uh, lists of places in his Perush where it needs to be updated. Um, and we have some of these lists survived in manuscripts. And we have, um, so from these lists, we have over a hundred places in Ramban's commentary that he wrote back that, please, anyone who already has a copy of my Perush, need, you need to um, add to it or uh, correct or adjust um, based on this list that I'm now, a uh, list of updates that I'm, now, that I'm now sending out. In some cases he updated, but it didn't make it to the list and frequently in, in many of the smaller um, updates. In this case, there were, there were a couple paragraphs here, and these paragraphs did make it to the uh, did make it to the list. Um, so in this case, Ramban deals with the issue of hine nayadati, and Ramban says after he quotes Rashi, "Aval ein sorech lechol hadivarim ha'ele, she'ein milat na more al davar she mora al davar she itchadesh ba'eta he bilvad." Ramban doesn't, doesn't understand like Rashbam and doesn't understand like Rashi. It's, uh, it's, um, but he's closer probably to, to Rashi. Ramban, what Ramban is saying is that na means now but it doesn't necessarily mean something that just, that suddenly became uh, true, that suddenly happened now. Ramban says, na is something that has always been there. It could be a davar hove ve'omed, something that has uh, been this way from, um, for, uh, for, for a long time already. Um, perhaps now it's relevant, um, but as opposed to Rashi, or as opposed to the first, the, the first couple interpretations in Rashi, that it was now only now that he realized Ramban says that that doesn't um, that doesn't seem to be, uh, be be correct, and this is Ramban consistent with the beginning of his perush. In the beginning of his perush, he says that this is what they would do. In the third paragraph of Ramban, he zed darkam lamo meet seitan mecharan bechol makom haya omer achotihi. Ramban says this was something they would do every place they every new place they would arrive at. Avram would ask Sarai to please say Achotiyat because he was concerned in every place. It wasn't something that they were only concerned about when they came to Mitzrayim. 
it was something that they did, not just in Mitzrayim, but also by Avimelech in Parakapala for next week's parasha. It was something, and not only in those two places, Ramban says, it was something they did regularly. So obviously, according to Ramban, it wasn't something that they realized just, that Avram realized just now, oh, he suddenly woke up and said, it's all right, it's beautiful. Now we have a problem. Um, this is something he always knew because they would always say, Yat. Um, so that's what Ramban, so this is, so at the, what he adds is consistent with what he said earlier. The na is not davar sheyit chadesh, but is something that is me'az v'ad ata. The difficulty, of course, for Ramban is why does, why does it say na then? Um, if it's something that was always there, um, so why, why the need to use the word, to use the word na? So what Ramban might say is that the na is the washon uh, ziruz, um, that, um, it's not really a, it's not such a meaningful, uh, it's not a meaningful word. It doesn't really have its own meaning, but uh, it's a way of saying, let's, um, let's do something. Um, so, so that could be a third possible, third possible approach to, um, to our, to our pasuk. So, um, so, so, so far we saw one example of where Rashbam's reconstructed commentary fills in a, um, a part of the history of Parshanut, has Rashbam reacting to Rashi, and also Rashbam coming in between the two commentaries of Ibn Ezra, and there winds up being a dialogue now between different Parshanim, Rashbam reacting to Rashi, Ibn Ezra then in his second commentary reacting to, reacting to Rashbam. In the few minutes that we have left, so let's take a look at another, another example of a reconstructed of a reconstructed Rashbam. Um, and we'll go to the third to the third example. Um, and we'll go to Parak Tedzayan. So you can follow the links in the email that was sent out or from our Mikrot Gizalot. So we can open up, click on Tedzayan, Parak Tedzayan, and go to Pasuk uh, Yudbet. So in this Pasuk, the Malach is talking to is talking to Hagar when Hagar runs away from 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 Sarai, and the Malach tells her to return to Sarai, and he Anita Chajadeha, and he tells her Hina Chara Violadet Bain the Karat Shemo Yishmael Ki Shama Hashem Elonye, the Hu Yeye Pere Adam Yadova Kol the Yad Kolbo the Al Penei Chol Echad Yishko. Now this pasuk is a very difficult um, pasuk. Almost every part of the pasuk can be interpreted in different ways. Peret, what's pere adam? What's yadov akol? What's yad kobo? What's al pnei cholechav um, yishkon? And here again, let's take a look at Rashi. We're going to um, read it uh, uh, read it quickly. Pere adam ohev mi barot atzuk chayot k'moshe katu vayeshe b'amibar vahiro bekasha yadov akol listis. In other versions, listim. Originally, though, the more uh, more original version is probably with a samach at that. The yad kolbo hakol sonin umit garinbo al penei chol echav yishkon sheyehi zaro gadol. Now, in Rashi here, there were four parts to the pasuk, four parts that Rashi is interpreting of the pasuk. How many of them are negative and how many are positive? Well, the first one is probably neutral. The second one, Yadol Bakol, that he's a bandit, um, certainly sounds negative. Yad Kobo, that everyone hates him and fights with him, um, is pretty negative. sounds positive. That's what we have in Rashi. And all sorts of Mepharshim have different interpretations of these words. In Rashbam, so until now, we've never had, we've never had Rashbam. And this, in particular, interpretation of Rashbam has a very uh, has a very unique uh, provenance. And I'm going to share um, my, uh, my, a different part of my screen. And um, we're going to see a different manuscript now. We see a manuscript from the Lutsky collection, Lutsky 749, and this is a manuscript of Rashi. And if we see the first line, the karat shemo yishmael, sivui hu in a keva, 
right? So that is Rashi from the previous previous pasuk, Sivuihu. Um, uh, here we have the word with Nekeva, and then Rashi says, and that's all we have in, um, in, in the manuscript here. And then we have Pere Adam Tosefta. Does everyone see the word Tosefta? I'll blow it up a little, a little more. Tosefta. Now that Tosefta is not the Tosefta that we know from, from, the, back of the, from the back of the Gemara, the Tanaitic work. So septa here means an addition to the manuscript. So Tosefta Socher Vitagar Now, because we only have a couple minutes, so we're gonna we're gonna go back to the Mikrot Gadolot uh, page and we'll read it from the Mikrot Gadolot rather than from the manuscript. But what we had there in the in that manuscript was in the middle of a Rashi manuscript. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, there was uh, actually something important. So we have to. So how how do we know this is Rashbam? Whoops, sorry, I made a mistake there. Um, so the, um, so at the end of this Tosefta, um, if we look down at the bottom of the manuscript, um, so we'll see Mipi Harav. Can anyone see the words at the bottom line there? Harav Rabbi Shmuel the Rabbi Meirzal, and then Pere Adam Ohiv Mi Barot Latzud goes back to the Perush of Rashi. So we have this Tosefta that's identified as a perush of, as a perush of Rashban. Back to our Mikrot Kedolot. So Rashban on this Pasuk writes, Pere Adam is not some sort of bandit, not some sort of hunter, but a socher, a merchant. V'tagar, she'yelech v'schora l'meirachok. And we have a minute left. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna go down to um, to, to the uh, continuation. Kishetefaresh pasugze nimseita lamed shekulo neemar bracha al yishmeilim. Rashbam says, does it make any sense that the malach who's trying to persuade Hagar to return and promising her that she's going to have a child is also going to tell her, and you should know that child's going to be um, the worst person in the world. He's going to be um, a bandit. He's going to be a robber. He's going to fight with everyone. Rashban says, that makes no sense. This pasuk is a bracha. That wouldn't make any sense. And Rashban then has this creative reading of the words pere adam. He thinks that pere adam comes from a foreigner, and the word the word paradam is is really somewhat ambiguous in 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 Tanakh. There are a number of psukim in which it's unclear what it means. And what Rashbam views how he views Yishmael here is he's going to be a merchant who's going to be a foreigner because he's always going to be moving around from country to country. Therefore, yado bakol sheyeshimo komine scharavi knemikolas alam schara, as opposed to Rashi who said that he's going to be robbing everybody and it's supposed to be yad kobol that everyone's going to be hating him. Rashbam says, "Gam kol adam yiknemi menu, kederech tagarim shenosim v'notnin in kol adam." Okay, so what we had here is a couple of examples where we have the ability, because of all these manuscripts that we have, of both of Rashi and other Tosafist commentaries, to reconstruct a good portion, probably up to about sixty percent, of the missing interpretations of Rashbam. Um, on these on these prakim, on these parashot at the beginning of the Torah. And Rashbam's interpretations are frequently very creative, usually very different than Rashi, because if they were just Rashi, then he had Rashi. There was no need for him to write his perush. So Rashbam is frequently reacting to Rashi, responding to Rashi, and giving a more pshat alternative, um, frequently an alternative that's related to other parallel psukim. And by using these different Tosafist manuscripts, so we can, we can now add... Um, a good portion of Rashbam Perush um, and have a richer uh, learning experience. Um, so I hope everyone um, enjoys using Al Torah. Um, there's a, a lot, lot, uh, hundreds of other features that uh, that we that we didn't look at today, um, but that you'll discover on your you can discover on your own um, as you use the site. Um, as you use the site, please be in contact. Um, there's um, people. Are, Every day, there are people that send in corrections, suggestions. Um, so we're very appreciative of all of the um, all of the input that uh, that we get, and we try to improve uh, um, our Torah accordingly. Um, and 
if um, and with everyone's help together, um, we'll we'll be able to to have a, a resource which will which will benefit Emir Hashem and the entire entire Torah entire Torah world.